A Beginner's Guide to Cybersecurity We are exposed to a variety of threats on a daily basis when we use the internet in some way. Whether that be downloading apps on a smartphone, reading emails, gaming, or anything else for that matter, there are security risks everywhere. Our data is extremely valuable and in the hands of the wrong person can easily be manipulated. Yet, with online scams, viruses and malware becoming much more advanced these days, it's often very difficult to spot. Even the most well-versed in cybersecurity can sometimes fail to identify security risks. That's why it's important to learn the fundamentals in IT security, to develop a strong understanding in how to keep yourself secure online. In this course, we'll learn about the common scams we might come across online, how to identify these security risks, and what you can do to protect yourself. Whether you merely use the internet for web browsing, work with intellectual property in your job role, or run your own online business, this course is designed to give you an introduction to cybersecurity. What makes data valuable? Millions, if not billions, of records containing personal information are stolen every year through data breaches, usually the result of cyber attacks. The fact is that data is a very valuable asset to have these days. Having access to such personal information can make huge profits for hackers. The risks of data falling into the wrong hands can result in the sale of personal data on the dark web to other cybercriminals who have their own agendas, identity theft, having access to personal information such as social security details, birth dates and full names might be all a hacker needs to lend large amounts of money or create fake official documents such as a passport. Online account hacks, such as access to your shopping accounts or online banking, or phishing scams, just having access to an email address or phone number can allow scammers to send bogus communications, often impersonating a trusted company. For businesses, suffering a cyber attack where personal information is hacked and accessed for the aforementioned gains, it can result in large costs to correct, have a big impact on the company reputation, and can quite often have dangerous legal consequences too, seeing fines imposed against them for failing to keep data safe. So, how are hackers able to acquire such personal information on such a wide scale? The answer lies in malware. What is malware? Malware is a blend of two words, malicious software. It's a software designed to cause intentional disruption to your infrastructure, often with very serious and harmful consequences. Malicious software has the potential to deprive you of access to your data, leak private and sensitive information, or use the data for the hacker's own means. Hackers use malware to exploit known vulnerabilities within software for destruction, profit, or sometimes even just for fun. There are various types of malware, each having different methods and intentions. Some of the most common types include worms, viruses, ransomware, trojans, keyloggers, adware, and spyware. The most common types of attacks are from the former, worms, viruses, and ransomware. Named for their ability to continuously replicate and spread through a computer's network, worms are intended to steal sensitive information, install other software, and corrupt the existing data on your hard drive. Worms are very sophisticated malware and are typically the result of software vulnerabilities, though they can also be accidentally downloaded through email phishing scams. In 1988, the first worm was unleashed to the internet, 
nicknamed the Morris worm. It spread incredibly quickly through the internet, infecting around 10% of all internet-connected computers within the first 24 hours. Ironically, the Morris worm was intended as a proof-of-concept attack to highlight flaws in internet security at the time. And whilst it certainly did just so, having even more of an impact than initially anticipated, it also resulted in the creator, Robert Morris, being convicted for violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. A virus, on the other hand, requires a little human intervention to instigate attack. The most common method is by getting users to click on download links on their websites, or open in attachments and emails, and installing the downloaded program. The year of 2001 saw a virus named the Anacornicova virus infect many by tricking email users into opening an attached image supposedly containing a photograph of Anna Kornikova. If you're wondering who on earth Anna Kornikova is, in 2001 she was one of the most searched terms on the internet, having reached the peak in her tennis career. The attachment contained a virus which would instantly download and infiltrate the user's computer, causing problems with email servers worldwide. Though it's well known due to its celebrity counterpart, the virus thankfully didn't actually do too much damage. Ransomware is a slightly different type of malware in the way that it acts. Its intention is never to leak data or steal information. In fact, typically ransomware never takes the data off your computer or network at all. In a ransomware attack, a hacker will install malicious software onto the target computer, which will restrict access to other data on the device and apply a cost for releasing these restrictions, essentially holding us to ransom. Whilst ransomware might appear to be a little milder in its execution, deciding whether or not to pay the ransom amount can have huge consequences in business. Payments are usually requested in cryptocurrency too, such as Bitcoin. This makes it harder or near impossible to trace the perpetrators, putting them in full control. Imagine, for example, you work for a large healthcare company delivering care for multiple patients per day. Suddenly having your patient records held to ransom can have severe consequences. Staff may not know who to visit, may have the potential to deliver the wrong medicines, and it can add huge delays to important appointments. This is precisely what happened in 2017, when a ransomware attack named WannaCry was unleashed to the internet infecting thousands of systems, including those used by the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, resulting in patients being turned away for treatments and operations, and causing unprecedented disruption. And whilst deciding to pay the ransom and return access to the data might just seem like the best option, that can leave the company vulnerable. The hacker now knows how important the data is to the business, and can easily ask for more money than previously requested. It also leaves the company vulnerable to further attacks. If the company paid up the first time, then hackers could easily strike again, knowing it to be an easy target. Thus, ransomware can be just as lethal to a business as any other type of malware. Trojans, also known as a Trojan horse, disguise themselves as legitimate pieces of software with the purpose of tricking you into executing malicious files onto your computer. For example, when we perform an internet search for Photoshop, we can be presented with many different website links offering downloads for the software package. Aside from the original creator's website, in this case Adobe, other websites offering free downloads can be packed full of harmful trojans, posing as the piece of software that you think you're downloading. The Zeus Trojan is a malicious malware used to steal banking information, which was first detected in 2007 and still remains as one of the biggest malware threats today, having mutated into other malware attacks too. Keyloggers, a form of spyware, keep track of the keystrokes made on your keyboard and record them into a log. This information is then used to gain unauthorised access to your accounts. A very common keylogger malware called Hawkeye has been making headlines again recently, having resurfaced during the COVID-19 pandemic. It saw fake emails impersonating the World Health Organization, 
encouraging users to download an attachment with important COVID-19 vaccination details. Once clicked, it installed a keylogger which tracked inputs such as banking details, which were uploaded to a remote server for hackers to access. Adware, another form of spyware, is a piece of software installed on your computer which displays various adverts. Adware collects personal information from you to serve you with more personalised ads. Whilst it may seem harmless, Adware has the potential to become malicious and harm your device by slowing it down, hijacking your browser and installing viruses and or spyware. Gator is a type of adware which will display advertisements based on your web browsing habits. It's often bundled in with numerous free software applications to remain undetected in downloads. And finally, spyware is a term which incorporates the use of keyloggers and adware. Spyware aims to track, collect and steal your personal information such as credit card details, web browsing data and saved passwords. This information can then be sold to other hackers to use for further intentions, or merely used to acquire goods. Now that we have a better understanding on how hackers can obtain our data, let's take a look at the ways in which we can better secure our data. How can we avoid malware? To understand how we can avoid malware, we must look at the most common mistakes victims make to accidentally permit its access. Opening links in emails and SMS messages. Try to be wary of any links you receive from both unknown senders and your own contacts. If something doesn't look right, or maybe seems too good to be true, avoid clicking the link and seek further advice. You may sometimes receive emails or SMS messages from existing contacts, people you know fairly well, but the content of the message seems a little different. It's fairly common to fall victim to malware this way. Hackers can use publicly available data to pretend to be a bank, insurance provider, or some other person in order to intimidate you into believing they are who they say they are. Downloading malware from an untrustworthy or unknown website. Always check the legitimacy of the website before downloading anything onto your computer. Viruses are present everywhere, even on the most innocent of websites, and of course they are always hidden in disguise. Whilst most computers and web browsers have built-in virus protection to alert you of possible threats, it's important not to rely too heavily on these, and the best way to mitigate risk is not to take a chance with downloading files you're unsure of in the first place. Clicking online advertisements. Commonly referred to as malvertising, advertisements which pop up when browsing websites can have viruses embedded into their code, which when clicked, can commence auto-downloading various sorts of malware, known as a drive-by download. Alternatively, the advert can redirect you to other malicious websites with malware embedded into their on-page links. Malvertising is a relatively new type of scam which is proving to be highly effective for hackers, since the innocence of online adverts means they can appear on otherwise very trustworthy websites, such as online newspapers or social media sites. It differs to adware, which we discussed earlier, in that adware is a piece of software downloaded to a computer, usually accompanied by the software intended to be downloaded, to then execute further threats such as spyware. Malvertisements are on-the-page web adverts, which convince you to download malware onto your computer or device. Keep yourself safe by searching for a product or website advertised manually, rather than relying on adverts to take you there. Social engineering. Social engineering has become a huge threat in the cyber world of recent years. In a social engineering attack, a hacker manipulates users into divulging personal or sensitive information by posing as someone you know, 
or as someone you can trust. It preys on the psychological aspects of our human behaviour and is often used in combination with the technical vulnerabilities in our software too. As with malware, there are various forms of social engineering, categorised by both the way that the attack is engineered and the type of information requested. Some of the most common forms of social engineering attacks are Baiting In a baiting scenario, hackers will entice victims into providing confidential information through the offers of free giveaways, discounted software, or early access to new films and music, for example. By taking the bait, victims may fall foul of unintentionally downloading malware onto their device, losing their money and never receiving the advertised offer, or supplying sensitive information, which can be used in other social engineering methods. Phishing. A very common phishing attack is through the use of voice phishing. This is where a hacker with access to your contact information will call pretending to be someone you know in order to obtain information. For example, a hacker may pretend to work in your IT department, requesting that you provide them with access to your work laptop in order to install urgent updates. These type of phishing attacks can also come in the form of emails or text messages, coined spear phishing, requesting that you provide access to your computer or urgently need to reset your password through the supplied reset link. Honey trap. Honey trapping describes an attempt for hackers to become romantically or sexually involved with a victim in order to yield sensitive information or money from them. Whilst these types of attacks aren't only restricted to cybercrime, honey trapping is becoming much more prevalent with online dating communities in recent years. Tailgating. A method used offline, tailgating involves a hacker following someone into a secure or restricted area such as an office with the claim to have mislaid their work ID or security pass. Scareware. Scareware attacks use a form of malware to warn users that their security software is out of date or that a malicious file has been detected on their computer. Essentially, it impersonates the role of a real antivirus software package. These pop-ups are used to entice users into visiting a website to download malware or to buy worthless products. Note that in most social engineering attacks, there is almost always a degree of urgency, a common tactic deployed to rush us and not give the victim time to properly assess the situation at hand. How can we avoid social engineering? Be wary of tempting offers. If you come across products at hugely discounted rates or free downloads for content which is charged for elsewhere, take a moment to think about why those offers are so good. Perhaps even perform an internet search on the company you've received these offers from to ensure their legitimacy. And remember, if something seems too good to be true, it usually is. Do your research. Take a look at the email senders. Does the email address match the company name? Other common giveaways in phishing attacks are spelling errors, broken links and poor quality images. Research the company names. Hover over the links supplied in emails and text messages. Do they look clean or do they appear to take you to an untrusted website? Never divulge information through an unsolicited channel. Be sure to understand the standard communication channels your company uses and stick to them. If your company doesn't permit banking information to be provided over the phone, for example, be wary of someone pressuring you to do so. Most legitimate customers will respect the procedures you have in place to keep everyone safe. Slow down. As we discussed, Social engineering tactics are designed to make you panic, to act first and think later. In any situation which requires you to act urgently to resolve issues, just take a step back and carefully review the situation beforehand. Always remember, if something were incredibly urgent, it's unlikely you would hear about that from an unknown source. Assess your social media. 
Social media, of course, is unfortunately rife with social engineering tactics. Given the vast amount of personal information published online, it's easy for a hacker to impersonate a friend, colleague, or someone else you may know to manipulate information from you. The more personal information you share online, the more at risk you are of falling victim to social engineering attacks. For example, it may feel harmless to post your new job role and workplace on your profile. It's exciting, of course. Yet just by posting this information, a hacker can easily use it to manipulate you by posing as a colleague at your new company, especially since you don't quite know everyone at the office yet. All it might take is a simple call to ask for your bank details for your salary and to double check the other information they have on you is right. They then potentially have all the information needed to impersonate you to others such as your bank. Social media scams usually use a combination of phishing and baiting attacks. Using the information already publicly available to their advantage, hackers can build your trust and bait you into signing up for scams or unknowingly distributing malware to your contacts in the form of a new game they recommend. In short, if you're unsure who may be messaging you, or if you have received a message from a friend that seems a little out of character, be sure to check the legitimacy before proceeding. Take conversations offline or use other contact sources to ensure the genuity of the messages you receive, especially if they are requesting personal information, money, or sharing an unknown link to a website. Physical security. Physical security is such a commonly overlooked area in data security, and yet it's very often the starting point for intricate data breaches. For sophisticated hackers, having physical access to your device is just like opening a treasure chest for them. It will give them access to all the data stored on both that device and potential to access over the company network. That's why it's so important to take the right steps in protecting yourself and your company from potential data breaches, which are much less sophisticated than you might think. Assessing your physical security should be the very first step you take when evaluating the security of your data. Let's consider the following scenarios. Are you putting your data at risk? Leaving your valuables unattended. Do you leave your bag or your rucksack in a cloakroom or under the desk? If so, are there any items in there which contain your personal data? These items can include your driving license, your bank cards, or any smartphone or tablet devices you carry with you. When traveling especially, we can put ourselves as easy targets since we tend to carry a lot of our personal valuables with us, such as your passport or your travel documents. Remember, any documents containing much more information than just simply your name should be kept safe at all times. It's easy to forget that the everyday items we carry with us can hold so much value for a hacker. Keep your work pass safe. If you use a work pass to gain access to the office or building you work in, make sure that you always have this in sight. Obtaining access to a work pass can put you at great risk of unwelcome visitors. And in a busy large office, new faces can easily go unnoticed. Passwords. It is still far too common to visit offices and see endless post-it notes stuck to computers and desks with various passwords written down. Yet with the varying complex requirements of passwords, not to mention the vast amounts of passwords we need to remember each day, it can seem like a very easy solution. And sure, it can't be that dangerous for a hacker to obtain access to the company Amazon account, can it? On the face of it, it might seem a minor risk, but when we consider the amount of data contained within each account, the risk becomes much greater. Amazon, for example, stores addresses, contact information, and of course, payment details. These may well be all a hacker needs to access much more sinister information about the company. Loss and theft. Have you ever lost or misplaced your phone? If you have, 
then you'll remember what a pain it is to set up a new device and reinstall all the apps and so forth that you had beforehand. It can easily keep you occupied for the entire day to get your device back to how it was before. And that's surely because the information you had on the device was important to you, right? Well, that can also make the lost device a hacker's delight. As we've mentioned before, having exclusive access to all of your information puts you at great risk if it falls into the wrong hands. Doubly so if you've had your device stolen. Whilst losing a device and having it fall into the wrong hands is certainly a risk, stealing devices implies intention, which can put yourself at even greater risk of your data being accessed. In the world of remote working, it's quite common for us to all carry company property to and from the office to home. So keep yourself alert to the risks of losing that property. Remote or hybrid working. As we've mentioned, the world has evolved quite significantly in recent years, with many of us working either exclusively remotely or a mix of both in office and from home. It's great for many of us, giving us the freedom to work from wherever we desire, not just our front rooms. However, that freedom has the opportunity to open up many more risks than before too. If you're prone to working in local cafeterias or trains or in any other public space, be careful that your screen isn't being watched by others. Are you aware of people who may be looking over your shoulder or even leaving your valuables out on the table whilst you nip to the loo? Be sure to stay alert when working in public places and that too for working in open office environments. You never quite know who may be watching your monitors. A relatively new market has opened up recently for co-working spaces, giving remote or self-employed workers the opportunity to work alongside others, despite not being colleagues, and create an in-office atmosphere again. Whilst they are a great solution for those who might live and work alone to get some much needed human interaction again, it's always worth considering where the desk is situated, for example, are you being overlooked by other people? The sensitivity of the data that you're working with, for example, if you're required to make company calls, might you be overheard? And even such things as the location of the printers or the scanners in the workspace. If you need to use their facilities, can you ensure privacy of that information? So, other than hiding away in a high security room at all times, what can we do to combat these potential risks? There are a few simple options that can be introduced to help. Don't leave your items unattended. It seems an easy one, yet it's quite common for us to become a little too complacent in scenarios when we encounter them regularly. For example, your favourite coffee shop. You go there every evening before your train. It's always quiet and you know the cashier by name. So instead of packing your valuables up in a bag, you just leave them for a couple of moments whilst you nip to the toilet. No harm done. It's easy to misjudge and mistrust situations just because they've become our everyday norm. So always, always think before you leave anything unattended, no matter how well you know the people that are around you. Taking items home with you. How safe is your office overnight? Do you have cleaners who visit in the evening? Leaving personal items at the office is all too common, especially if you work in the same location every day or commute by public transport. Lugging everything to and from can be a real pain. As with leaving items unattended, leaving your personal items in an office, which more than just you have access to, puts you at risk of that information being stolen. Think about the ease of someone gaining access to the company office building with a stray work pass they found. So whilst yes, it might be a pain to lug things to and from quite regularly, in the long run it might just save you a huge amount of pain. Use locked cabinets. An easy solution to ease the burden of carrying all your belongings everywhere is to consider locked cabinets in your office or your place of work. Take a look at the items in your office which contain information. Could they be locked away at the end of the day to mitigate the potential risks? This could include laptops, tablet devices, keys, payment terminals, notebooks or hard copies of insurance documents and such. 
Safes and lockable cabinets often come with keys or PIN codes to enter for access. If you choose the former, remember to take the key off-site, else it can be pretty useless. Be wary of using bins. It sounds far-fetched, yet I've lost count of the amount of times I've seen people carelessly dispose of documents in the bin without a single attempt to remove sensitive information. It's good practice to always have a shredder on site when dealing with paperwork so that any sensitive information can be disposed of correctly without concern. Avoid plugging physical devices into your laptop or computer. Do you know their origins? Things such as SD cards, USB sticks or external hard drives can carry malicious files that can infiltrate your data on your computer. Where possible, Try to ensure any plug-and-play device is plugged into a computer which is not connected to your main company network, and ensure that it doesn't contain any sensitive information. As a general rule of thumb, if you don't own the external device, don't plug it into your computer. Get to know the people around you. If you work in a busy office environment, it's worth taking the time to understand the people who work with you. That doesn't necessarily mean becoming friends with everyone. Rather, it's a good opportunity for you to remember their faces and names. That way, you can identify new faces in the office, and potentially people who shouldn't necessarily be there. It can be quite difficult when you work in such a large company when new staff members might appear every day, but it's worth making the effort where possible. Ask to see ID. Oftentimes it might not be possible to know every person who enters your workplace, so be sure to check the ID of individuals you don't know personally. This could be tradespeople, post people, or visitors on site to attend a meeting. Operating ID checks for all also means you don't run the risk of offending people when asked. It may also be useful to use internal visitor badges or visitor lanyards which prevents others from asking the same questions each time. Use screen locks and timeouts. Sometimes it's impossible to carry all personal belongings with us, for example desktop computers. So try to get into the habit of locking your screen when it isn't in use or you're away from your desk. As a failsafe, it's also worth utilising the timeout options on your computer meaning it will lock itself automatically after a certain period of inactivity, though be sure not to become reliant on this. And finally, store passwords securely. As we've discussed, the varying levels of password complexity requirements and sheer amount of passwords we need to use every day makes it somewhat impossible to remember every single one. Instead of opting for a notebook to jog your memory though, Try to use secure password software, which encrypts your passwords and makes it much less likely to fall into the wrong hands. Software such as LastPass offer online password vaults to securely store and share passwords between other members of your team too. It's also much easier to access the passwords from anywhere, given these are cloud stored, so you'll never be without access when you need it the most. We'll discuss password management software in more detail further into this course. What steps can you take to protect yourself online? Keep your software up to date. As we discussed earlier, not updating your software can easily put you at risk of threats from hackers who have uncovered vulnerabilities in that software version. To avoid any potential malware attacks, keep your IT up to date and avoid using older versions of software, especially software such as customer databases, accounting and payment software, and antivirus solutions. Keeping your software up to date is one of the most crucial steps in combating potential data exploits. Everything evolves over time, and software is continuously improving and changing. That, however, also includes malicious software built by hackers. In software, there are two types of public releases, 
beta and general releases. A general release is the version made available to all users, having been fully tested and signed off by the company's in-house quality assurance. This is also commonly known as a major software release. A beta release, also known as a minor release, is typically offered to a small group of people who have been selected to take part in the beta program. Beta releases usually contain very small amounts of changes, bug fixes, or new features to the software, and their point is to ensure all new changes are in full working order before being made available to the wider public on a general release. Often, a general release can contain the changes made in multiple beta releases at once. It's important to understand the differences and acknowledge there may well be bigger risks in joining beta programs for your software solution. So what does this have to do with cybersecurity? Well, these software releases often contain crucial bug fixes or improvements to ensure the best security of the software you use. These bugs, which are found within existing versions of the software, can sometimes have the potential to give hackers an easy way into your database. The more popular the piece of software is too, the more potential there is that more and more hackers are discovering vulnerabilities to exploit. The best advice is to always update to the latest version of the software you use, whether that be a full smartphone update, updates to apps you use regularly, or packaged updates to your computer's operating system. The quicker you do the updates, the less potential there is for you to suffer any consequences of known security issues. Use antivirus software. Antivirus software works by monitoring, detecting, quarantining and deleting malicious programs from running and causing damage to your computer or device. Quite often, some of the more modern devices come with built-in antivirus software, such as smartphones and tablet devices. Antivirus software will also perform regular or real-time scans to check for any threats. It's important to ensure your antivirus is always running so that it can check files and downloads routinely and avoid potential risks. Take regular backups. Backing up important data is crucial for business continuity in the face of a cyber attack. A backup allows us to create a carbon copy of our data, which can be restored in the event of any data loss. And data loss isn't just as a result of malware attacks. It might be the result of hardware or software failure, data corruption, or human error such as accidental deletion of the data. Whatever the reason, it's good practice to ensure sensitive, important information is consistently backed up so that businesses can recover data quickly without having a big impact on everyday duties. It might be as simple as copying important files onto an external drive, such as a USB stick, or your company may utilise online storage facilities, such as Dropbox or iCloud, where you can also upload copies of your files. What's important to remember here is to be consistent and regular with your backups to minimise the amount of data lost between the last backup and now. The more time that passes during backups, the more potential there is for data loss, if or when recovering the data. It's also good practice to retain multiple copies of your data backups on different platforms, essentially backing up the backup. This could mean you back up to a USB and have a copy in the cloud storage too. By doing so, you will minimise the chance of your backups being inaccessible due to data corruption, for example. Another option is to look at real-time backup solutions, which permit your computer to automatically save a copy of every change made to your data, usually to a chosen cloud storage solution. Be careful when using public Wi-Fi. Public Wi-Fi can be found in many popular places such as cafes, airports and train stations, allowing you free access to the internet from your devices. Whilst these types of hotspots are very convenient for allowing you to check your emails or communicate with colleagues whilst on the move, it can often be quite risky, especially when accessing sensitive information over public Wi-Fi networks. The problem with public Wi-Fi is that the security is often pretty lax or non-existent on the networks. A lack of secure network policies leaves these Wi-Fi hotspots open to attacks and could mean you're not the only person accessing your data. 
It's quite typical for our devices such as smartphones, tablets and laptops to store Wi-Fi networks as trusted connections, meaning they will auto-connect to the Wi-Fi network when you're within reach of it. This is perfectly fine for certain networks such as your home Wi-Fi or the wireless network at your office. However, when it comes to public Wi-Fi networks, you should ensure your device isn't set to auto-connect without you even knowing. Better still, turn your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi off on your devices when you don't require access to them. If your company offers a VPN, a virtual private network, for you to access through, it's important that you always use this so that any sensitive data you access remains secure, no matter the Wi-Fi used. Assess website security. You may already be familiar with seeing HTTP and HTTPS as a prefix on website addresses you visit. Without getting too deep into their roles, if you're going to log into any site, make sure the address at the top of your web browser starts with HTTPS and not HTTP. On some web browsers, such as Google Chrome, you may also see a padlock symbol next to the address bar which defines that the website uses HTTPS. The S stands for secure, and it means the site is encrypting your data, making your personal information, payment details and communications safe. Be aware of what information you share online. It's worth remembering that anything you share on the internet, even if it's subsequently deleted, is there to stay. When you post information on social media, it is available for others to share, screenshot and repost as they see fit. So be careful with the information you choose to publish about yourself. Try to avoid posting things such as photos of your workplace, details of who you work for, photos which may indirectly show sensitive information in the background, such as a laptop screen or documents on a table, any banking information or finance details, personal information such as your date of birth, full name and home address, or sensitive documents with unredacted information. If you do use social media, consider your privacy on those accounts. Facebook and many other apps have some great privacy filters you can apply to restrict access to the personal information you share. It's also important to review your social network. Do you know your friends and followers personally? And finally, use strong passwords. Using strong passwords is imperative to keeping your data safe. In recent years, password requirements have become much more complex than before, with many companies enforcing specific characters and setting minimum lengths to help keep us safe. Ensure that you always use a unique password. Never use the same password for multiple sites or accounts. If one site gets hacked and gains access to your password, this will mean the other accounts are also vulnerable. For example, if malware successfully accesses your email account, using the same password for your online banking or online shopping accounts means that these can be hacked with ease. Set a lengthy password. Try to use passwords with a minimum length of 8 characters. And the longer the password, the stronger it is. It takes much longer and more difficulty to crack the password. Personally, I would aim for between 15 and 20 characters as a general rule of thumb. Use a mix of characters or passphrases. Using symbols or numbers in your passwords can help make them stronger. Whilst there have been extensive studies refuting the benefits of using such characters in passwords, it's generally still a good idea to utilise different characters in your passwords. Better still, the use of passphrases have become very popular in recent years. These are sentence-like strings with nonsensical combinations of three or four words in replacement of symbols and random characters. For example, red pyjama smile ninja. They are certainly more beneficial for remembering our passwords and their popularity is growing based on hackers' software having difficulty cracking them. Never use words or phrases that are personal to you. Whilst using your pet's name or the street that you grew up on may help you remember your password, doing so also makes you more vulnerable to someone guessing your password. 
that doesn't necessarily leave you just vulnerable to your inner circle hacking you either. Thanks to the ever-growing world of social media, it's easy to unknowingly post password hints, such as a photo of your dog captioned with his name on Instagram, or showing your support for your favourite football team, which can easily be accessed to the wider public. Be unpredictable. Regularly changing your passwords is not too much of a necessity these days. Why change the password if it has never been breached? Regularly changing your password can also result in incremental changes, for example updating the password from password1 to password2, which is still pretty guessable and leaves us with a false sense of security. I update my password every 90 days so I'm unhackable. That said, it's certainly good practice to change passwords if your data has been found in a security breach. The website Have I Been Pwned is a good place to start. It's a simple to use site allowing users to check if their passwords or any other personal data has been compromised in data breaches. By sticking to the rule of one unique password per website or account, it can then be a much easier task of finding the breached account and updating the password for it. In certain circumstances, you may also find it beneficial to update other passwords too, such as if your personal information has been compromised, for example your date of birth or your address. This, alongside your password, can be a hacker's dream for getting access to more secure software such as your online banking. Never write your password down. Physically writing down your password no longer makes it unique. You're essentially creating a carbon copy. It's pretty commonplace in the workplace to see sticky notes with passwords scrawled all over them, attached to monitors and desks. Even if you're not writing down the website it's for, or the username to combine it with, it's still a huge security risk and should be avoided at all costs. Use multi-factor authentication. If websites or accounts you use offer the chance to use two-factor or multi-factor authentication, it should always be utilised. Multi-factor authentication means that you will need two, or sometimes even more than two, forms of identification to successfully log into your account. The first form is almost always a password, and the additional forms can be either a memorable word or a code produced by an alternative application, such as Google Authenticator. Authy or LastPass. The use of multi-factor authentication dramatically reduces the successfulness of hackers. Remember, even with the best password in the world, you can always fall victim to data breaches. And once that password has been breached, it potentially becomes accessible to anyone with malicious intent. Use a password manager. All this talk about creating unique passwords with random symbols, extensive characters and regularly updating them can of course feel like the burden we never signed up to carry when joining the workforce. That, combined with the inability to simply scribble them down somewhere in the back of a notebook, can of course feel quite pointless. At least, it was until password managers came along. Password managers such as LastPass, 1Password and NordPass to name but a few, are designed to securely store all your passwords in one online vault. This vault can then be accessed with a master password, the only one you need to remember. Password managers have proved very successful for large businesses too, whereby multiple users may need access to the same accounts, giving you the opportunity to securely share your passwords with one another. And finally, consider using biometrics. A large amount of modern technology now allows the use of biometrics instead of, or addition to, a normal password. Where a password consists of alphanumeric characters, biometrics use things such as your fingerprint, retina or face scanning, and even voice characteristics for authentication. These have become fairly typical on smartphones in recent years, and you may already use one or two of these methods to access your device. The main benefit for using biometrics is that they are typically hard to steal or reproduce. A fingerprint is most certainly going to require more sophisticated software to recreate than that needed to guess passwords. That said, it's certainly not impossible, and there is still much discussion surrounding the storage of biometric data. If our fingerprints, irises and other unique patterns are stored online, 
This still gives the same potential for hackers to access this information in data breaches. However, when used in combination with multi-factor authentication, biometrics can most certainly be a very secure method, providing multiple layers of defence. The discussion around what makes a strong password is in constant debate, and that's largely due to advances in the software hackers can use to discover passwords. Historically, this type of software would use combinations of characters to crack the password. Adding more symbols and numbers to the mix made it more difficult for the software to be successful. However, in recent years the password guessing software has become smarter, and no longer simply produces random guesses. It now uses algorithms which analyse previously leaked passwords to find patterns in password creation and build better assumptions around our human behaviour. Software is constantly evolving and becoming smarter than before, so it has never been more important to ensure that we are regularly reviewing the passwords and security used to prepare our cyber selves against potential attacks. And though some of the aforementioned methods of keeping our passwords safe may well seem like common sense, it can be very easy to become complacent as time goes on. We are likely all guilty of using the same password across multiple websites or writing it down somewhere so that we can remember it, so it's important that we take the time to assess the risks in our own complacency. How can you help your company to stay safe? Get to know people in your workplace. As the saying goes, it's always good to put a face to a name. Do you know your colleagues? Can you identify them if needed? If you're new to your workplace, it's always a good idea to introduce yourself to your colleagues. If you work in a larger business, start by getting to know those who work in the same department as you and then focus on other key players in your workplace, such as the IT team, department managers, and your HR representatives. Of course, with many businesses now adopting remote working opportunities, this can make it trickier to introduce yourself. In these circumstances, it's good to take the opportunity to introduce yourself on the company chat software, or perhaps in virtual meetings. Perhaps your company has a Meet the Team page, or a document outlining the company structure. If not, it's certainly worth proposing the idea to your manager. Knowing the people around you, and ensuring people know who you are, is an excellent way of reducing potential social engineering attacks. Look at the company policies. Take the time to read your company's policies surrounding IT and cyber security. These policies will not only outline the do's and don'ts of IT use, but also give you a clearer view on which individuals you need to speak to if you're unsure, having issues, or looking for some further advice. Check the social media pages. Pay close attention to your company's social media and online presence. It's always helpful to have another person casting an eye over the content being published you might just pick up on something sensitive that was missed by the original poster. Or perhaps you'll even spot malicious adverts impersonating your business, which could easily do severe damage to your company's reputation. Educate others. Your company's cyber security is important. It's what keeps you and your colleagues safe from potential hacks, which could possibly have personal repercussions such as dismissal, redundancy or disciplinary action if the hack or the breach is a result of misuse. So it's important that you take the time to educate others on the correct practices for handling data and keeping it safe. Whether that be running workshops and presentations for your team, or simply talking to a colleague one-on-one -on -one to give some advice on how best to manage the data security, it's a great opportunity to instill best practices in the workplace. Be sensible with the data you use and where you store it. It's important that you are always assessing the way that you are accessing and storing data in your role. Be sensible with how you're handling company information, and if something feels wrong, check before you proceed. Try to avoid leaving external devices lying around on your desk, 
check who has access to company drives before sharing data there, and be careful with the information you provide to external sources. Send data securely, even internally. We share data every day in business, often without knowing we're doing so. Perhaps you're sharing a spreadsheet with a colleague to take a look at, emailing a contract to a customer, or are requesting a password for one of the company accounts. Whatever the need, it's important that you ensure the data is going to be secure in transit and will only be accessible by the persons who require it. Employ the use of password managers and secure file sharing software to keep everyone safe. Respect company property. As we have discussed earlier in this course, ensuring the physical security of your devices and equipment is the first step to keeping data secure, so it's important that you respect the property that you're supplied with. This means avoiding leaving the company laptop in your car overnight, resisting the temptation to use the company devices for personal use such as web browsing or gaming, and ensuring you do not plug in external equipment such as USB devices or hard drives where you don't know their origins. Report something you see. Never feel worried about reporting something that concerns you. It's always better to be overcautious, and any company would prefer to dismiss multiple reports of concern than miss something serious which might have otherwise been picked up on. Check your company policies so that you understand who you should direct your concerns towards. And finally, take instant action. If you're ever concerned that you may have inadvertently downloaded malware, or are the victim of an attack, the first thing you should always attempt to do is remove the power from your computer. Pull the plug out, turn your laptop off, disconnect the Wi-Fi, or if the computer is connected to a local network, remove the network cable from the machine. Taking instant action like this will slow down an attack and prevent it from spreading across the company network. You should do this before attempting to report your concern and never try to remove sensitive information first. The quickest and most effective method to shutting down a malware attack that's in progress is to remove the power source immediately. Standards, Frameworks and Regulations Practicing good cybersecurity should be at the forefront of every business, not only because the consequences of data breaches are enough to make anyone feel a little nauseous, but also because of our ethics and morals. We shouldn't feel obligated to keep data secure merely for the threat of what consequences we may face. More so, we should feel it is our moral duty to look after the data we handle every day. After all, we entrust other businesses with our own data and expect them to keep our information safe. So why wouldn't we want to do the same for our own customers? How do we know we're doing the right thing, though? Well, in order to help businesses ensure they are on the right track with keeping data safe, there are many principles which provide direction for data security, helping to ensure that everyone is singing the same tune, so to speak. Security Frameworks there are various cybersecurity frameworks available for businesses to adopt. They consist of documented processes defining the procedures around how to implement and manage ongoing security controls. They provide a basis for achieving strong security and preventing data breaches. And in some cases, they can enable businesses to become certified. Depending on the industry or location that you work in, there may well be a mandatory requirement to certify that you comply with certain frameworks. Essentially, by adopting security frameworks, you are assuring your customers that you meet a satisfactory level of security. Examples of such frameworks are ISO 27001 and 27002, the internationally recognised standard for cybersecurity, COBIT, NIST security framework, and CIS controls. Data regulations. Often the location of your business will mean it's mandatory to comply with strict data regulations. These are sets of rules written and enforced by law, 
and are designed to ensure the protection and security of all its citizens' personal information. The regulations which impact on personal data protection vary significantly country to country. In some regions, such as Europe, there are stringent, clear-cut rules which can result in heavy fines for those found to be breaking them, whereas in other areas you may find it more difficult to find a formal regulation as of yet. In fact, it's thought that nearly 15% of countries still do not have any legislation surrounding data protection and cyber security. Let's take a look at some of the most successful privacy laws in place around the world right now. In 2016, a new regulation concerning data protection and privacy was introduced across European law, called the General Data Protection Regulation. The GDPR requires that all personal data must be processed securely using appropriate technical and organisational measures. In brief, GDPR sets restrictions on the transfer of data, i.e. where in the world personal data can be housed, regulates consent for the processing of personal data, and provides individuals with the rights for their data to be erased. Whilst the GDPR doesn't directly set specific cybersecurity requirements, it's an important regulation to be aware of if you work within the EU, since the regulations indirectly dictate how you should be performing backups of your data, such as which software platforms can be utilised, and who may be permitted access to such data to fulfil a role requiring appropriate privacy safeguarding to be put in place within the workplace. GDPR is an important component in mitigating risks with security breaches and malware attacks. By implementing and adhering to the relevant requirements, companies can adopt better safeguarding processes surrounding data storage and backups, meaning the potential for personal data, such as customer details, patient information and so forth, to be accessed by the wrong person is minimised. The Data Protection Act of 2018 is the UK's implementation of the GDPR, providing specific data protection regulations which apply within the UK context. In 2013, the Protection of Personal Information Act was introduced in South Africa, having standards which are just as rigorous to that of Europe's GDPR. The Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act was implemented in Canada, defining the rights of access and data privacy ruling for many private sector organisations. The Personal Data Protection Law of Bahrain was the first of its kind to be introduced in the Middle East in 2018, providing individuals with rights concerning how their data is collected, processed and stored. And of course we also have the US, which has various data protection laws enforced at state level. The California Consumer Privacy Act is considered one of the most powerful US legislations, providing Californian residents with data privacy rights not too dissimilar to those outlined with the GDPR. Company standards. In addition to these frameworks and regulations, businesses may also build their own standards for data security. These standards are of course unique to each organisation, and they very much depend on what is important to a business. Company standards are used as a guideline to outline exactly what is expected of you, an employee, to ensure the quality and safety of cybersecurity in the office. That might mean it's a requirement that you leave your company-issued laptop in a locked cabinet when not in use, or to outline specific password policies such as enforcing two-factor authentication on all smartphone devices. Standards are what a company aspires to and will certainly be guided by the frameworks and regulations enforced by external organisations. Thank you for joining me in this guide to Cyber Security Essentials. I certainly hope it has been a useful insight into cybercrime and given you some practical techniques to adopt that will help to keep you and your business safe online. It's important to remember that everyone, no matter what their role in a business, plays a critical part in cybersecurity. Thus, it's crucial that you understand both the impact you as an individual can have when handling data and fundamentally how you can minimise those risks. At the end of this course, you will find a quiz based on the topics we've covered today, 
alongside some resources you can access for further reading.